Thank you. So I have a question for you all. How do we build bonds? We have another question. Why do we build bonds? Well, generally, it's because we have something in common, right? Maybe we like the same movie. Maybe we hate the same band. <laughs> but what if we could build bonds of love and trust with people who are more marginalized than us? And what if we could use those bonds to build a better world? So I'm here today to talk about the ways in which I built those bonds in my documentary, Access Denied, Food, Deserts, and Disability in Mississippi. So let's start with who I am. My name is Rashika Torres. I'm from Melrose Houses in the South Bronx. And I've never had an issue with food insecurity. There was always food on my table. Right? And I also don't consider myself a person with a disability. So I think the next question you're asking is, how does someone like me, who in some ways embodies a northern carpetbagger, go all the way to Mississippi and not only get people to speak to me, but let me shove a camera in their face. Well, one of the keys is to listen. And so as I said, I'm from the Bronx. The Bronx is very interesting. About 50% of neighborhoods in the Bronx are either experiencing high poverty or extreme poverty. So just because I had food on my table didn't mean that there weren't things just outside my door that I couldn't ignore. Older people would talk about leaner times in their homes. And they're not talking because they want your opinion or because they want your judgment. They just want you to listen. So when I first started to get people interested in my work, I decided it would be a great idea to mail letters. Not email. I mailed physical letters to the organizations I wanted to work with. I thought that in this age that they would appreciate getting physical letters in the mail. I don't think they did because no one ever responded back to them. I know. <laughs> so I decided to call each and every organization I sent a letter to. About three or four of those people picked up the phone. And one person was willing to talk to me for more than a few moments. We had an amazing conversation. I told her about my documentary, and she told me about a conference in Jackson that I should attend. But before she ended the call, she said this, be careful. These people have been taken advantage of before. They may not want to talk to you. So I could have been offended and talked about my track record as an activist, but I didn't. When she was done speaking, I simply said, I understand. And understand I did. So as I said, I'm also not a person with a disability. But I've been a disability rights activist for about 10 years now. And this was no accident. It started out listening to my friends in college talk about issues that they were having with accommodations or socialization, professors, other students. And I realized something, that if I paid attention to what they needed to say rather than what I needed to hear, I could find my place in all of this. So I said listening is key. But it's not just listening. It's what to listen for. Oftentimes, we hear or we see problems, and we think to ourselves, well, I have the answer to that. I have the solution. That's kind of where we go wrong. But don't worry. A lot of people in organizations, they do the same thing, and that's where they fail, too. They think their solutions are unique or innovative. But the problem is that they're not really listening for solutions. They're just listening so that they can inject their own, right? They're waiting for their turn to be saviors. But the world doesn't need more saviors. It needs more helpers. More on that later, don't worry. So you may be wondering, why Mississippi? Well, I will tell you about the Magnolia State. Mississippi is full of very interesting and powerful intersections. So when we're looking at national data in terms of population for people with disabilities, it's about 20%. So one in five people in the United States has a disability. 
And in Mississippi, it's about 15%. And when we look at the unemployment rate, when I was doing the research for this film, it was about 5% nationwide, and in Mississippi, it was about 5.4%. But when we look at the unemployment rates for people with disabilities, that number generally doubles. So at the time, it was 10%. But in Mississippi, it's 29%. So there's also this interesting relationship with food. Of the $3 trillion agribusiness that the US has, Mississippi brings in about 7.5 billion or more of that every year. But Mississippi is full of food deserts. So simply put, a food desert is a geographical area about half a mile, a mile wide, that doesn't have access to fresh food, meats, produce, vegetables, things like that. So barring restaurants or bodegas, which, you know, corner stores, bodegas, same thing to me, I'm from the Bronx, <laughs> they represent a lack of access. So my question was this, how does having a disability hinder someone from accessing food, whether they live two miles away from a store or two blocks away? There was no way I could come up with this answer on my own but I could sit and listen to those who did. So when I first got to Mississippi, I got there a few days before the conference, I wanted to get my bearings and I wanted to film some action shots. I wanted people to get a feel for what Jackson looked like. But here's the thing, I wanted to film shots that I knew wouldn't be invasive or intrusive things that I wouldn't have to worry about with consent. So for instance, I wasn't filming anyone's faces. I wasn't filming anyone's personal addresses. I wasn't filming any license plates. Because those kinds of things are not helpful. They're invasive and intrusive. So like I said, consent here is key. So no shots of things I couldn't get consent for. And when I landed, at the conference a few days after I got to Mississippi. I met with the woman who I spoke with on the phone. She was amazing. Even better in person than she was on the phone. It was great. So she smiled and I smiled. She talked and I listened. And so I asked if I could film the banner of the conference for my documentary. And right before that, something very interesting happened. A local news station came in to film parts of the conference. And they just came in with their cameras on and recording. And quite a few people there felt uncomfortable because they didn't give any consent for this. The only people who wound up speaking to this camera crew were the vendors and some of the organizers. And to me, that was a big red flag of what not to do. So a few days into the conference at their luncheon, they announce me and they talk about my documentary and I stand up and I raise my hand. And interestingly enough, the people who wound up sitting for these interviews with me were either people I'd been sitting with at the conference the whole time or friends of those people. Because when I had no credibility, they gave me theirs. And each time I sat with someone, I remembered all of my biases. That I was a woman from a different region and a different culture. And I also remembered something else, that people are experts of their own experiences. And we have much more to learn by listening to them and remembering these things as we talk to them. And so as I sat with all of them, I thought about who I was each time. Who are you? The caterpillar asked Alice in Wonderland. Who are you indeed? So I am a helper. I don't always share a lot in common with the people that I advocate with. Maybe we share a language. Maybe we share a culture. Maybe a race. Maybe a gender. But here's the thing we always share. Their hopes, their goals, and their dreams in actualizing equity for their communities, recognizing that they know what's best for them. And I come to these conclusions, you know, 
like I said, as a girl from the South Bronx. Because I know what it's like to be silenced. I know what it's like to be overlooked. And I know what it's like to be uplifted. And so speaking with all of these participants and remembering my biases and remembering that they are the experts, one thing that came back again and again is to always recognize that people in these situations, no matter who they are or where they are, are not destitute or without hope. It's quite the opposite because they know the solutions because they are living with the problem. And so I want to share something that Dr. Scott Crawford, one of the people I interviewed early on and that I sat at the conference with for a few days, said to me when he talked about issues of accessing foods, one of the things he came back to again and again was transportation. And he said that you know people with disabilities want to live an independent life. And in order to be able to get fresh, healthy foods and live that independent life, we need accessible transportation by way of trains, buses, what have you. He said without that, people with disabilities are going to be more dependent on others. And he said it's not necessary, it's not fiscally responsible, and it's not justice. It's not justice. So I want to ask you one more question. Maybe you've noticed, maybe you haven't. But I've only been sharing very personal stories about myself. I told you where I was from. I told you my biases. And I told you the thoughts going through my head. What I didn't share were personal stories about my participants, the things that happened off camera. And there's a reason for that. They told me when to film, what to film, when to stop. They looked over all of my footage before I sent it to editing. They looked over all my footage after I sent it to editing. So sharing things that they did not want me to share would be outside of the bounds of consent. And even though filming has ended, filming is over now, I still keep those promises I made to them. And I would like to end this by saying, my name is Washika Torres. And I'm one of many tools in a toolbox. And I'm helping a community, not saving it. Thank you.